Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast, beginning with the genealogy in chapter one, the Gospel of Matthew challenges its addressees to rethink their understanding of the words king and kingdom. Now, in chapter 16, as they enter a city named after Philip of Macedon, the chips are down. If Peter truly understands the lesson of the bread and can discern the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, can he tell the difference between the Son of Man and the Son of the Gods? It's time for Peter to take a stand. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 to 16. Please join Richard and I for a free three-week webinar series on Ephesians chapter 4, sponsored by the Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative on April 4th, 11th, and 25th at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern. To register for the webinar, please visit orthodoxservantleaders.com and click Events. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 322 of the Bible as Literature podcast. We continue in the Gospel of Matthew and hit what seemed to be a turning point because after repeating the examples of the bread and the meaning of the bread and the forgetfulness of the disciples with respect to the bread— the insistence upon God's provision of bread. After all of that, in verse 12, the disciples seem to begin to understand what Jesus was teaching. Finally, they understand, having faith that Jesus can provide the bread that gives life, which is his teaching, and how this is very different than the Pharisees and the Sadducees who are looking at the sky, wondering about their actual bread, wondering when it's going to rain and when it's not going to rain, whereas Jesus wants his disciples to be mainly concerned about Scripture, and they're finally understanding that when the Pharisees and the Sadducees are looking up at the skies to see when it's going to rain, this is their teaching. And you have to be aware of this teaching because it seems like common sense. It seems like what a normal person would be concerned about. But Jesus is trying to get them to think about something more important, something bigger, and that is Scripture, the teaching of his Father. Jesus is going to quiz them to see if they really do understand and what they understand and how they stand compared to other people around them. When a general is on the outskirts of a city, and has plans to capture the city or reconquer it. He needs to make sure that his soldiers are aligned and understand where they stand relative to the mission. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, I began before the verse, Richard, with a military metaphor, because the name of the city, again, calls to mind Alexander the Great, because Caesarea Philippi is a region named after the father of Alexander the Great, Philip of Macedon. There is this sense that Jesus is conquering this territory. Remember, the militaristic imagery in Mark was very clear. You could see how Jesus was, in fact, taking ground. And here he is taking ground. But if he's going to go all in on this mission, he needs to know where his disciples stand. 
because this is a turning point. And with the context that they began to understand this might be the right moment for that pop quiz. This might be just perfect timing for the Christ. When he says, who do they say that the Son of Man is, he wants to know what they've been listening to. How much have you been listening to those other people? Remember, he just had to distinguish, divide the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees from what he himself is trying to teach. But he needs to see which side are the disciples on. Who do they think that the Son of Man is? Because the Son of Man hopefully is informed by Scripture and not by the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, not by this foreign teaching that looks around the environment to figure out what might be going on, which is the people. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Because the disciples are thinking along those lines. They're going to be in trouble because they're not following Scripture. Scripture is not their reference. It's interesting that you have the title Son of Man juxtaposition with the name Caesarea Philippi. Because if you're going to go all in to take back that territory from the Hellenes, you want to have a son of the gods on your team. But there's this very interesting use of Ben Adam, which in its own way is anti-kingly. You want to have the savior of Rome and the son of the gods leading you into that battle, but they don't have that. They have the son of man. So this question, who do people say that the son of man is, is a really important question because it tests the earlier discussion about where you get your news. If you're thinking about Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great as the source of your security, then you're going to care very much about the weather and the stock market right there with the Sadducees. But if you trust in the provision of the Father of Jesus, then you will be at ease with this title, Ben Adam. It challenges the addressee to think twice about how they talk about Jesus's function as king. Because he's not a king the way that Caesar, Philip of Macedon, or Alexander the Great were kings. And he's not conquering this territory with chariots and soldiers. So it's a very interesting expression here. There's a discrepancy in the manuscripts. Some say, who do men say that the Son of Man is? And others say, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? It's only a small word, me, meaning me, that distinguishes the two. The best evidence would say it is not about Jesus himself. It's about the title itself, but it could go either way according to the manuscripts. So who can we identify this with? And they say John the Baptist, because he was the one who was the last of the prophets, saying that the kingdom of heaven is at hand all throughout the beginning of this book. Then we have Elias, who was taken up into the heavens and never saw death, or we never find out about his death in Scripture. And others, Jeremiah, who went into captivity and never left. And then we have one of the prophets. So it could just be any one of the prophets. But in any case, it was someone who brings this teaching of repentance, because John the Baptist said to repent, and of Jeremiah said, we have to give up, can't fight against the enemy and against the invaders. And Elias was the one who was fighting against the prophets of Baal and against the encroachments of the enemy, the Philistines. All of them were teaching Israel to repent. The other interesting thing about these three characters, Richard, is that all of them hint at confrontation and violence. John the Baptist is heralding the coming of the kingdom, and then he's executed by the king who feels threatened by that message. He's almost like an advanced messenger that goes out in front of the army, and then the opposing army has him killed and sends him back in a body bag just before the main battle. And then you have Elijah, who ascends on the chariots of Israel, which is a sign of hope that the armies of the kingdom are going to come and be victorious. There's hope. And now you have the prophet Jeremiah, for whom the famous expression, 
Jeremiad was coined, meaning that when someone lays into you, it's a Jeremiad. And he is so forceful in his critique and his judgment of Israel and Jerusalem that many people consider him too controversial to keep within the biblical canon. So something's being teed up here by way of a confrontation between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of men. So this question about Jesus being a lowly Ben Adam, just an average man, even though the way the title is used, he makes it special. This question about him being a Ben Adam versus a son of the gods, or in the case of Jesus, the son of God, is a very critical question. Clearly, the people understand the Son of Man to be some kind of herald, someone who brings the word of the kingdom of heaven, who brings this word of judgment to the kingdom of this world. Now, do we need to read the question as Jesus asking about himself as the Son of Man, or as what the people think in general the Son of Man means? Because if we say that people are saying this about the Son of Man, as in who the herald is, then when Jesus asks, who he is, he's going to ask in the context of, is he the son of man, according to the disciples, or is he not the son of man, according to the disciples? This becomes the relevant question. This is the quiz. And can the son of man defeat the sons of the gods? Can this Ben Adam put Caesar in his place? He said to them, but who do you say that I am. And it's interesting. First, he asks, what are people saying? And now he's saying, I want to know what you are saying. These are two distinct questions from Jesus. In verse 15, there is no question among the manuscripts whether this is about Jesus or not. He's asking about who I am. And they have to answer that in light of the previous question, which is vis-a-vis the Son of Man. So Jesus is asking, am I I, the Son of Man, according to what you understand the Son of Man to be, do I fulfill that function as far as you understand that function? So there's a question about the function of the Son of Man and the identity of Jesus as that Son of Man. What Jesus is doing by laying these two questions out consecutively is baselining with his disciples. Okay, we have this function, Ben Adam. Tell me, what are people saying about this function? Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, who do you say that I am? And then we can weigh in the balance how you're comparing me with the standard definition of Son of Man in people's minds, and we can see what you've learned from me. Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is a forceful statement about Jesus as the earthly representative of his God. He is the earthly representative of God the Father. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. It is so critical that Peter is able to say this within the context of the title Son of Man, because he is recognizing that this person who's going by this ordinary title— This person is actually the king. This is, in fact, evidence for the teacher, Jesus, that Peter now understands the problem with the leaven of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Because again, if you go by their leaven, you're going to look for Julius Caesar, and you're going to check the stock market. If you go by the biblical sign, you can suddenly see that the one who is really the king is the one who looks ordinary and simple. It's different than Mark, because in Mark, Jesus tells them at this point not to say anything because they don't understand. They are confused. So he doesn't want them to talk about the resurrection, because for them, the resurrection still means the might of Caesar. But here there's a chance by the grace of the Spirit that Peter recognizes that the power of the resurrection does not look like the power of Julius Caesar. It's a different situation in Matthew. The power of Julius Caesar definitely is the distinguishing line between who Caesar is and what this king is going to look like. There's an important contrast here between the Son of Man and what 
Peter says, the Christ, the Son of the living God, because who the people think the Son of Man is, is a kind of herald who says, hey, by the way, the King is coming. That's what John the Baptist does. That's what Jeremiah does. That's what the prophets do. And even the idea was that Elias would come down again to say, okay, it's time for the end times to appear. But they're always the herald. They're announcing the coming of the king. But when Simon Peter says, you are the Christ, that means he is the anointed one. He is the king. He is the son of God. He is the one who is the son and inherits the power of the kingdom and as the son of the living God, not the son of man. So, yes, he's a human being, obviously, but son of God, son of the living God means that he's more than just a herald. He is the one who is ruling. It's different because the herald is the one who comes and says, hear ye, hear ye, the king is coming. That's what the Son of Man seems to be doing in this passage. But the Son of God is the one who is coming. Jesus has now arrived, and Peter has recognized that this is the one who's going to rule. Now, this is going to be put to the final test, like you said, Father, on the cross, because they said, this is the Son of God. This is what the Messiah looks like. This is going to be our king. And then they have to look at him up on a cross, which becomes very problematic if you're looking around at Caesar and looking at the stock market and looking at the seasons to try and figure out what a Messiah or a king is supposed to be. Jesus is very different, but at least we know that Peter is on the right track. We know he's on the right track because he understands that what Jesus is doing is different than what John the Baptist and Elias and Jeremiah and the other prophets did, which was announce the word, announce the need for repentance because of this coming kingdom. Jesus is the one who represents the kingdom. This is what John the Baptist announced at the beginning of this book and at the beginning of Mark. And this is the kingdom of heaven that has been announced all the way through. Remember, we made such a big deal about that at the beginning of the book. It has disappeared as a major theme for a while, but here it comes again. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and therefore the inheritor of the kingdom and the representative of God on earth. And this expression, living God, is very interesting. Just listen to this passage from chapter 1 of First Thessalonians. You turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. So here in this brief excerpt from Matthew, we see the tension between the false gods, the idols, the kings of the earth, and the Son of Man. So they're turning from these false idols to the true and living God who appears to us as a lowly man, but is in fact the king and the son of the living God, who rescues us from the wrath to come. So you have the tension, the foreshadowing of this wrath, and the example of the characters that came in the answer to the first question, and now you have the hope. So Peter's confession really is powerful in its rejection of kingly power, and that's the hope of Matthew's teaching. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.